Hi everybody, I'm Tim from TroutandFeather.com and in this fly tying video we're going to tie and discuss a generic jig nymph. Stay tuned. Before we start tying this jig nymph, I really want to stress the word generic in the pattern and that's going to relate to the materials that I'm using and recommending today. Now these materials are those that I've used for the last few years and I've had a lot of success with. I'll explain my choice either during the tying or after that portion of the video, but I really also want to encourage all of you to substitute if you don't have these exact materials and that's not a bad thing by any means. I guarantee you're going to find some materials that will work possibly equal to or even better than the materials I'm going to show you today. And if you're really having a lot of success with them, you better share them with me. So um, I'll kind of talk about that as we go along and we'll also talk about what it means to be a generic jig nymph after the tying. But let's start the tying. In my Stonfo Transformer Vice, I have a hook from Allen Fly Fishing. It's a jig hook. This is their J100BL. And I prefer this between sizes 8 to about a size 14. I'm tying a size 14 today. Now with these jig hooks, if you pair them with a tungsten bead, which I have on right now, what's going to happen is that they're going to be more inclined to ride hook point up, which means it's going to reduce the amount of snags you have and hopefully keep your hook point sharper. Is there still a possibility for a snag? Yes, by all means, but we're going to try to reduce that, that if we can. The tungsten bead is a 7 64th. It's a slotted disco bead, and that slot's just going to allow you to, to get it around the bend and also to put it in the right location at the front whenever you're tying off. Well, let's get started and we're gonna add our, our first material slash thread and that's some dot Uni thread and the color's olive. Now the reason I'm calling this a material is because for this generic pattern, we're gonna use this for the body. So let's not overthink this one and let's try to keep it as simple as possible. After I have a base established, we're going to tie in our tailing fibers. And this is where we're going to say some of the magic happens because the fiber that we're going to be using today is called Coque de Lyon. This is really considered a magic fiber for a, a ton of reasons. And there's some great stories out there that I'm going to have to share at some point. But what fly fishermen and fly tires really like about this material are two of its traits. Number one, it's got a great modeled look to it. It kind of reminds me like a mallard flank with all that modeling and all those fibers. Number two, and this is probably the more important reason why so many are turning to it right now, is that it's a very durable material. It doesn't tear very easily. And that's something to keep in mind on these nymphs that are going to be bouncing along the bottom, that you're going to be catching fish with. You're not going to have to worry about the tails breaking off. I'm just going to pull one of these feathers that has some really nice modeled fibers. and grab a little stack of them. I'm gonna line these up against the hook. And sometimes using these jig hooks can be a little difficult. I noticed that I noticed that many tires have a tendency to make the tails a little longer on these. I want them to be from about the bend of the hook to right around the, the crease where the eye goes down. And I will tell you if they go a little bit long, like this one, maybe just a tad, all you have to do is just back it off a little bit and retie it in place. But I can tell you, I'd much rather have my tailing fibers longer than shorter on this pattern. This Coque de Leon comes in a lot of different colors. I, I, when I say a lot, I shouldn't say that. Uh, it comes in, I believe, a light, a medium, and a dark pardo. I get lots of emails asking which one I recommend, and it's a really tough choice. It really just depends on almost, it seems like, what day I'm tying. In this video, I'm using the light pardo color. I really like that because it just seems like I can see that modeling a lot better. So in 2015, it's light pardo. In 2014, it was the darker the medium. So it, it's really, to me, it's not as important as long as you can see that modeled look. All right, next I'm going to be tying in just a light silver wire. I'm going to pair this with that tungsten bead. That's why I'm choosing sil silver. I'm going to do a really good job to, to make sure my wraps are, we'll say borderline touching on the way back because this is going to be, this thread is going to be our body material. So we want to make sure we have all of those gaps kind of closed off. 
All right, once I have that thread, I'm sorry, that wire tied in, let me show you what I'm using. It's a uni French wire. The color is silver. The size is small. Some really nice stuff. They have this in a couple different sizes. All right, now returning to the fly, let's take a look at what we've established so far. We have a nice olive body that's just getting started, but if you look on my side, you might be able to see that wire peeking through. So we have to do our best to just cover that up. But we also want to help to form a little bit of a transition as we go from the, the tail of this body up towards the thorax. So I'm going to make this, this is going to be my final wrap the whole way back. I'm going to kind of help that tail up. I'm going to wrap forward. Now I'm going to wrap back and only go about three quarters of the way. Now back forward. I'm going to start tapering this. Now back not nearly as far. You can see now we're starting to establish our taper. I'm going to build up this little section right in here just a tad. And now it's looking good. At this point, I'm next going to wrap my wire forward. When I get it up near the head, I'm really just going to wrap it up there to add a little bit additional weight and just make sure it's also wrapped in place, kind of wrapping it over itself, locking it in place. We can just helicopter that wire off. All right, next I want to make sure that my bead is lined up correctly. And there's only two different ways it really will sit in there. And once you start to get your materials in, there's only one way that will allow it to really sit flush with that eye. And once I get in that location, I like to just build up a little bit of thread in there just so I know it's not going to go anywhere. All right, but finally now we're left with our thorax. And, and this is really a, a neat part of this fly of these jig nymphs. Now for the thorax, let me first show you the dubbing that, that I'm going to recommend using today. And this is some really neat dubbing I've used before. It's Jean Simon, if I'm pronouncing that right. Great, if not, I apologize. It's Peacock Dubbing. It's Peacock Eye. It's a really neat blend. It's got some great colors to it. You can buy this where it's already cut down in smaller sections, and this is a little bit longer. Now, we have a couple different options to apply this. We can dub it directly onto our thread and wrap it around, and then we can just use something to help create kind of that buggy that buggy look to make it look a, like there's legs kind of jotting out, or we can establish some type of a loop. Now in this case, I'll use just a, a little tool. This is a Stonfo dubbing loop tool. I use this quite a bit. I'm just going to create a little dubbing loop. And what I like about the dubbing loop is that it helps us to keep it a little bit, let will say a little more established, and it really help with that bugginess. Let me see if I can zoom out a little bit, give you a, a better view. So with this dubbing loop, I've tied it in. There's two points on it, and there's a little triangle on my side. So, so I've locked that in. I'm wrapping my thread forward, and now I'm going to go back to my dubbing. I'm going to pull this apart in little clumps. I don't want to make it too heavy, and I'm just going to place it in there. Once I have it in, I'm going to pull the, this dubbing loop tool towards me. Now what's neat about this is that there's a ball bearing or multiple ones in here, and all I have to do is simply spin. I'm going to create almost a dubbing brush. Let me hold it up so you can get an idea of what it looks like. Kind of like a, a buggy chenille. I don't want to go too tight because I don't want to break my A dot thread. Once I get it in position, I can just turn. You can see this, is, this tool's got a really neat feature. And I can start wrapping this. Now, as I wrap, I want to just pull these fibers back a little bit just to palmer them. Just to kind of help them go in that direction. We're going to wrap the whole way up to that bead. 
Once we get there, I'm just gonna leave this straight up. Tie it off. And we can immediately trim it. I'm gonna try to trim it as close as possible. Now let me zoom in so you can get an idea of what's going on here. Now, what's great about that dubbing loop tool, we've instantly created this buggy profile already. Now, if I would have dubbed it, I would have probably then gone to some type of a tool like this one that has a Velcro point, so I can just pick out those fibers. But because we use that dubbing loop tool, it's pretty much done for us. In fact, it's almost too crazy. So I'm actually gonna tie it off and I'm gonna play with those just a little bit more. So to tie this off, I'm just gonna pull all the fibers back, get a couple wraps in front, and go right to a whip finish. I'm going to lock it in once, then I grab a little bit of glue, some hard as nails, place some of my thread, <coughs> excuse me, and finish with a few more wraps. Trim my thread, and now I'm just going to pull this material up a little bit, see how long it is. I'm actually gonna trim a little bit off the front. I wanna make sure it's about the same length. Once I have that, I can then go back a little bit and just do a little touch up around it. Just see if there's anything going on that isn't to my liking. But right now, we have a really great looking fly. I'll give you a 360 of it. And now let's talk a little bit about these characteristics of this jig nymph that you're going to notice. For starters, we have that Coke de Leon tail. We have a really resistant tail with a relatively strong profile. We have a very slender body. It's ribbed. It was an easy body to create. There's now we can get we can add a little bit of difficulty to it if we decide to use a biot body. Though in this case this is a really simple one to start with. And then finally we have that buggy thorax at the front. To finish things off, we have that tungsten bead that <coughs> excuse me, is going to get this fly directly down into that water column, get it down quickly so those fish have a chance to grab at it right away. So once again, here's a 360 of just a generic olive jig nymph. And now let's talk a little bit more about this pattern. Now let's look at this from both a fly tying and a fly fishing perspective, and we'll start with tying. This is one of those flies that I do not recommend immediately starting to tie and cranking out three or four dozen today. Instead, tie a few like I did in the video, but then look at this pattern as kind of a gateway to other jig nymphs, if that makes any sense at all. There are some easy modifications that you can make to almost guarantee that you're gonna have success in your local waters. Some simple ones might include changing that olive thread body to a black or a brown thread body instead. Another change that I make occasionally is changing that thorax. I typically really love just a little bit of flash in there, but sometimes I'll go with an all natural body material for that thorax. And typically whenever I do that, I'll place some type of a hot spot between the bead and the thorax. And by hot spot, all I really mean is just a couple wraps of a fluorescent colored thread. A final consideration that I really want you to keep in mind is the weight of this. And that's really that tungsten bead that we have at the front. If I'm fishing this in really deep pools, I'm gonna be fishing it with a larger tungsten bead. So I wanna have a few tied up that way. If I'm gonna be fishing this more through riffles, then I may even just have a regular bead or I may have a smaller tungsten bead, one that's not gonna get me snagged on a regular basis. So those are some just really small considerations to keep in mind whenever you're tying this. But by all means, use your creativity and see what you come up with. There are so many ways that you can alter this fly and take it to so many different levels. And I definitely encourage you to do so. And if you're trying to challenge yourself and saying, all right, I have a few of these generic ones tied, how can I make it just a little bit more difficult? Then my next suggestion would be change that thread body to a biop body. You get a really sleek and thin body. It's gonna look extremely lifelike and it's gonna make your, your tying just kind of improve slightly because it's a little bit more of a challenging skill. But try that and good luck with it. If you make any alterations or any changes to this pattern, or if there's anything that you can think of that you would recommend others trying, please, by all means, mention them in the comments section below because I know everyone would love to hear about all your different ideas that you have. Next, let's look at this from that fly fishing perspective. 
There's one common denominator to the water types in which I fish these jig nymphs, and that's fast moving water. So I love to fish them in riffles and in pools as long as that water is really just rushing by in a hurry. When I think about this tungsten bead on the front of these jig nymphs, that's going to help us get this fly to the bottom of the water column, right where those trout are. And whenever this fly is coming through and it's really fast moving water, those trout just have a split second to make that decision to opt to the fly or away from it. I believe they're going to take it more often than not. The one thing that we have to absolutely keep in mind is that this is a generic pattern. It's not intended to represent that specific insect that the trout might be feeding on at that time. However, we want it kind of close. So we want to get the general size, general shape to kind of give that impression that this is an insect that's coming through the water and those trout want to eat it. So we want to make sure that it, it looks similar and it's in that same water column as the real insects. Now one little strategy or one little tip I can give you is that over the last few seasons I've been having a lot of success with this in riffles with large rocks. I like to work downstream to upstream and I, as I creep towards those rocks I like to take a tuck cast and cast a really heavy jig nymph directly on the downstream side of that rock. More often than not I've had a lot of really large trout go after that fly and I've caught them because I really believe that that really heavy weight, that tungsten bead, when it's paired with that tuck cast gets that fly down in a hurry right to where those trout are sitting. So by all means, try that on your favorite rivers, just not on the ones that I fish, please. The other thing I want to talk about with this fly is the fact that I use it as a point fly a lot. And what that means is I use it as basically a heavy fly to also get another fly down. Now whenever I'm doing that, I typically won't use that tuck cast because I'm fishing two flies and I really don't want to get those all tangled up. But I'll use this jig nymph as my point fly. I'll tie it on first. And then off the bend of the hook, I'll tie on around a 6 to 10 inch piece of tippet, typically around 5x. And then I'll tie on a smaller fly, maybe a betis fly or something along those, those lines in a size 18. And what's going to happen now, we have this heavy jig nymph coming through that water column and it's keeping that second fly down. So if those fish see these two flies, they're probably going to see that jig nymph first. They may not take that nymph, but now they've turned to it. They're looking in that direction when it goes by them. Now there's a second more realistic fly right in their vision and they have a chance to grow, go after that one as well. So definitely try that technique out. Try fishing these two flies. And finally, don't be afraid to fish this in larger sizes. I love to fish these in size 8, size 10, and size 12, with size 10 maybe being my favorite size to fish this. I know that sounds really large, and it is. I fish a lot of the eastern United States streams, and I have a lot of success with a size 10 jig nymph. So take that in and think about some ways that you can integrate it into your own fishing. The final piece that I want to talk about is the leader that you're going to be using. Whenever I fish this in, we'll say a really shallow riffle, I really prefer not to use a strike indicator, a floating one. Instead, what I like to do is just build in some cider material into my leader. And cider is spelled S-I-G-H-T-E-R. There's a couple brands of material out there and it's basically just a high-vis orange or pink or fluorescent green that you will just tie in on two sides and you'll kind of use that as your indicator because you can see that and you won't have that floating strike indicator working against you, causing your jig nymph to either slow down or speed up. So keep all that stuff in mind and play with this because I guarantee you're going to have success with these flies. I know I have over the last few years. That's why I'm encouraging everyone out there to try them too on your own. Well, with all that said, thank you so much for viewing this video on just a generic jig nymph. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the comments section below, or you can email me at tkamisa at gmail.com. I'd really love to hear from all of you that have fished with these jig nymphs in the past. Are there any patterns or styles or any fly fishing tips that have worked for you? If so, please mention them in the comments section below so the entire community watching this video can really benefit from those. It's really great to learn from one another. If you'd like to see more of my fly tying or fly fishing videos, you can check out my website, which is troutandfeather.com. I also have a Facebook page, and if you like that, you'll receive some regular fly fishing and fly tying updates as I post them throughout the week. Well, once again, everybody, thank you so much for viewing this video, and I really hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about some generic jig nymphs.